Hello, and welcome to the second part of the decentering historiography section we've been going through. And in this section, we're going to be looking at African American historiography. So, first, there's a couple of very important themes we need to think about when we approach African American historiography, and this is something we'll kind of come back to. And the first is how do you integrate African American history into a historical narrative of, say, American history? while maintaining a distinct African-American identity, right? How do we, in a sense, emphasize equality and the importance of African-American history to the history of the whole United States while also maintaining a particular African-American identity, right? That's kind of a tension. Anytime we talk about difference that threatens equality, right? If everything's the same, it's easy to say everybody's equal. But when there's difference, and when we say I am something, we're, say, we're also saying I am not something else, right? If I'm X, I'm not Y, we're asserting a difference. And I think this tension is in a sense at the very heart of what it is to be an American in many ways but I think it's particularly felt by people who are minorities, such as African-Americans, right? How do we fit ourselves into this broader story of the United States as full and equal members, as vital parts of American history, while also maintaining our own identity as a distinct group, right? We want to be Americans. We've played an important role in American history, we want e the equality that's often been denied us, but it's also important to maintain our own distinct identity. And I think every community, every group has, in a sense, this basic desire. Like, but like I said, I think it's most, it, it's particularly keenly felt among African Americans because of their unique history in our country. Moreover, another tension is how do we understand the injustice that African Americans have faced without removing their agency, right? How do we understand the injustice African Americans face without removing their agency? What do I mean by that? So, for example, if I tell the story of my ancestors, the ancestors we know about, um, most of them were rather poor in Europe. A lot of them came from a place called Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, in the border between France and Germany. So we were not particularly well off, m my ancestors. But they made a choice to come to the United States and try and make a new life. In the case of the ancestors of most African Americans, there was no choice involved, right? They were forcibly kidnapped from Africa and brought as slaves and suffered a huge amount of injustice. Now, we have to tell the story of that injustice. But how do we do that in a way that is still respectful of the fact that even as these um, Africans and later African Americans were subjected to the injustice of slavery, how do we also capture their agency, their ability to shape and impact the world they lived in? Their attempts to resist bondage, to escape it, to overthrow it, and so forth. So how on one side, in a sense, do we recognize how African Americans were victims of injustice, while also not reducing them to only being victims of injustice? So these are tensions, right? These are things we have to balance equality while also recognizing diversity, recognizing injustice while also recognizing agency. And that's something to continuously think about in this section. Now, once a uh, lecture I give in this class is this idea of narrative, how people tell stories about history and how that impacts how we understand the, the world we live in. So, one thing about slavery, slavery is, on the face of it, you know, is 
just pretty awful when you look at it, right? The basic fact of slavery is you force someone to work and you don't let them have the fruits of their labor. So they, they do the work while you get all the profit. There's a lot of other terrible things about slavery as well, but I want to, to emphasize that in particular, right? That the basic root of slavery, the reason you would want to have a slave, as evil as that is, is that you can make the slave work and then you get the profit. Now, in the United States, there's something very important going on in that people in free states that did not, in which slavery was illegal, could witness and could view slavery, right? All you had to do is walk from a free state to a slave state and you could see it. So in the United States, there was very much an effort to present slavery as a benign institution. And in this lithograph, you kind of see that idea. You have this very nice orderly image in which people seem to know their place and to be happy in it. But there, and that's the idea, it's a benign institution. Slavery is not that bad. Uh, slaves are happy, they're well clothed, they're well taken care of. They do work that's not that much different from maybe what white laborers are doing. So it's really not that bad. In fact, the argument went, it was good for slaves to be slaves because there was something intrinsically wrong with them. They were different, and that difference signaled inequality. So left in, say, Africa, uh, African people would not know um, the benefits of good morality, good government, a good economy, uh, correct religion, and so forth. Uh, they were inferior, and so making them into slaves gave them advantages that they would not otherwise have. So it's okay, right? That's the basic logic. Now I feel just disgusted explaining it. I mean, it's, it's terrible and it's false, but we, we have to stress that the institution of slavery in the American colonies and later the United States tried to present itself as beneficial to people of African descent, to African Americans, to slaves, as a way of justifying exploiting their labor, making them do the work and keeping the profit. And we have to understand that in African American historiography, a lot of that historiography is based on challenging this, of trying to say this is a false reality. This is not true. This, is, this image here is very pretty, but it's not really the way things are. This image is much more like how things were. You have the white overseer here on a horse to better keep a track on people, to make him higher, literally, than the slaves, to give him kind of advantage that there is a fight, making sure that slaves uh, are doing the work assigned them. And I have to stress one thing that we really need to emphasize is that this was a system of racial slavery. Um, I study Korea. In Korea, historically, Korea had slaves, but they were other Koreans. This is a different kind of slavery. This is a slavery based on the idea that one race, in this case, people of European descent, white people, were superior whereas people of African descent, black people, were inferior. And therefore, it was right and just for the inferior to serve the superior as slaves. And like I said, this is the reality. This image shows reality more here, this kind of hierarchy. Um, it, it has the implied threat of violence, but we have to stress this was an extraordinarily violent system. The only way you can get people to be... I, I shouldn't say willing, but the only way you can get people to accept being forced to work while someone else gets the profit is by having a lot of violence you can use against them. So 
if what happens then is people engage in African-American history, trying to write it, as we'll see, they're, they're ha they have to deal with this reality of slavery, right? And a lot of times, of course, as you can maybe guess, the first people really interested in African-American history were African-Americans, especially freed slaves, right? Slaves who somehow either ran away or bought their freedom or something like that. And since slavery was based on the idea of racial difference being connected to racial inequality, these first histories of African-American people included also histories of African people and attempted to argue that they were essentially equal with people of European descent. Now, there's kind of an argument about which one of these two works, Light and Truth, or a textbook of the origin history of the colored people, which one of these came first, right? Which is the true first history, and I won't go into detail why there's an, an argument about them. I do think it's interesting that in the 1840s, you would have two such books come out. But what's interesting about these books, if you look at this one, for example, by James Pennington, right? A textbook of the origin and history of the colored people. And he's tracing things back through the Bible. Both Pennington and Lewis were also Christian ministers. Lewis is particularly interesting as well because he was also of Native American descent. And what's interesting here, notice he says the Bible and ancient and modern history. So there's this attempt by these African-American Christians, in this case ministers in particular, to try and not just tell the history of people of African descent in the United States, but to go back into biblical history to try and argue that they are fundamentally human beings equal to all other human beings. So they're, they're using history to challenge these ideas of racial inequality which are used to justify slavery. So I want to stress this. Early African-American historiography is trying to challenge slavery by arguing for equality. And it does this not simply by looking at fairly recent history, but also by looking more at trying to connect ideas of the Bible and Christianity and equality in order to challenge these ideas. Now, there's an important transition that's going to happen after the Civil War. There is a, a scholar, or a very fascinating man, not just a scholar, but a man named George Washington Williams, who was just able as a teenager to fight in the Civil War. He participated in the Civil War. I'm wanting to say he was a drummer, if I recall correctly, but he was in, um, he was active in the Civil War. He would continue in the United States Army and later serve in other positions and would actually go um, to Africa, to the Belgian Congo, where he would challenge um, King Leopold's colony, how they were using um, basically really terrible means to force the Africans there to extract rubber. But he writes this fascinating book called The History of the Negro Race in America from 1619 to uh 1890, uh, Negroes as slaves, as soldiers, and as citizens. And his goal is very similar. He's still thinking in terms about equality, but you'll notice he has, and he's still a religious thinker, he still emphasizes religion, but notice he's not as interested in going back as far. Right? He's not going all the way back to the Bible, in a sense, and to biblical religious history. He's focusing on this period from 1619 to 1880. And so we see in George Washington Williams a transition, in a sense, away from these ministers who were focusing on religion in particular to try and, and talk connecting African-American history to biblical history to a more contemporary-focused history. And one thing about Williams 
um, he's one area where we can criticize his work is sometimes he just quotes entire documents without really analyzing them, right? Historians, we should analyze documents. But the key thing is he brings in into his work large amounts of primary sources for the reader to engage with. Right, so there's a shift with Williams to a what we might consider a more professional, in a secular sense, type of history. So it's important for us to note that even though African American history, in some ways, is going to be different than other schools of historiography during this time, it's not isolated. Right, there's still this idea we want to try and do more scientific history, for example. Now, Williams, like I said, is connected to the Civil War. We need now to look at how differing understandings of the American Civil War are connected to African-American historiography. One issue, of course, is what were the causes of the American Civil War? Why was there a war? And why was there a war at this particular time? And you may have heard this debate, was the Civil War an irrepressible or re repressible conflict. And what does that mean? Well, an irrepressible conflict means the one that would have happened no matter what. We were destined to have a civil war at some point. It's not clear. You know, there were certain reasons why it happened in 1861. It could have happened in 1850. It could have happened later. But from a person who takes an irrepressible perspective, it says there was going to be a war. It was caused by the inherent incompatibility of free and slave societies. And so it therefore could not be prevented. No matter what, there's going to be a war. It cannot be prevented. There's no way this thing can be prevented. Because the conflict is inherent in the fact that free and slave societies are so different. Right? They cannot get along together. They're fundamentally incompatible. From the perspective of a repressible conflict, this argues that the war could have been prevented because it was essentially caused by extremism and a failure to compromise. In from the perspective of people who argue that the Civil War was repressible, the big villains are the abolitionists. Uh, the abolitionist people like Frederick Douglass, um, William uh, Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison, the Grimke sister, uh, Angelina Grimke, they are blamed for the war. Their desire to see slavery end as soon as possible, their opposition to slavery on moral grounds made it impossible to compromise. If they had been willing to compromise and if American politicians would have better done a better job of compromising, the war could have been prevented. We would have not had a civil war. Now, in my opinion as a historian, and I think I'm mainstream in this, is I think it was an irrepressible conflict. I don't think it could have been prevented. I think it was going to happen um, anyway, or at the very least, I think at some point secession would have happened, and it's hard to imagine the federal government not fighting if secession happened, but I do think it was an irrepressible conflict. I think it, that the uh, development of these very different societies um, in one country meant that there would eventually be a war. However, what I want to stress, because the focus is in this is on African-American historiography, if you think that this is repressible, that this could have been prevented, that shows a kind of marginalization of African-American interests, right? Because, like I said, people who say that this was repressible will frequently single out the abolitionists and say, oh, it's those abolitionists. They're the reason we had a war because they wouldn't compromise. Well, that, it, this is kind of, I mean, I'm kind of struggling for the right words here. I don't know how you can compromise with slavery, right? You can't be like half free and half slave. Right. And if you're an African-American, what else is there? Right. I mean, this is the central issue. For you. Right. There's a world of difference between being free and being a slave. It's completely different. That's why it gave rise to two completely different societies. So 
when we for people who take the argument that this is repressible, they argue there could have been a compromise. The only compromise that Southern states would, or that slaveholding states, I should say, would have accepted was slavery in perpetuity, slavery forever, based upon ideas of white supremacy. That was the only compromise they would accept, was accepting that. And I think it's interesting the abolitionists get blamed for the unwillingness to compromise when, you know, you had people basically saying, well, you know, um, we're going to keep having slavery. It's going to go forever and we want to expand. Um, it's that our way or the highway. I don't see how that's any um, less uh, willingness to compromise. But in any case, when you're making this argument that the Civil War could have been prevented by compromise, any compromise would have left slavery. And that, for African Americans in particular, that was like the most important thing to get rid of, right? For them, of course, and it makes sense, that was something that should not be compromised on and you know, just to throw in my two cents, I'm on the side of the abolitionists here. I mean, that's easier to say now, but people would argue with me on this today. You know, I think the abolitionists uh, and the African-Americans were, and you could be both, of course, were correct. Right? This is something that we can't compromise on. We can't do this. It doesn't make sense to talk about a country based on ideas of freedom and liberty when slavery is allowed. Right? And I've already given you kind of my own view. Like I said, I fall on the irrepressible perspective. Um, I think that central to the cause of the war was the issue of slavery. And I don't think there should have been compromise on the issue. Um, any, because any compromise would involve the continuation of slavery. Now, what's really striking to me, I want to stress, I'm not sure how, what the exact consensus is. Like I said, I take the irrepressible view but I remember I was at a conference and a conference speaker argued that this, he took the view that this was a repressible conflict. And I was really shocked. I was really surprised um, that he took that view. Uh, he basically argued that the Civil War was a religious war because it was a religious war. There was no compromise. And, you know, I was just really surprised that this person made this argument and um, I really wish there would have been time for more questions from the audience because I wanted to see him challenged and defend his perspective. Because like I said, it just seemed very odd to me. And it, from a perspective of, I guess you could say social justice, it just seemed really wrong. Because it was just basically saying, yeah, it's fine. You know, we can just not care about these people who were enslaved. In any case, key here you can see even to this day, arguments about the understanding of the American Civil War are very important, and they are especially important for African-American historiography. 